planet Earth, our home, indeed our only home. It sustains us. It sustains all the creatures in the biosphere. It provides for our communities. It provides for our children. It's a beautiful blue dot floating in that black space. But it's increasingly under threat due to climate change. I've had the privilege of traveling across Canada talking to Canadians about their experiences with climate change. The birthplace of this work is in the Canadian Arctic. I've lived in the Canadian Arctic. I've been adopted by Inuit families. I've spent time on the land. I've eaten the foods. I've watched the sea ice melt. I've watched the glaciers recede. I lived in the Canadian Arctic during the hottest decade on record. And I can tell you with my own eyes I have seen the profound changes to this region. I made a film with Zacharias Kunuk, the acclaimed Inuk filmmaker who made Atanaju at the Fast Runner. We made a film called Inuit Knowledge and Climate Change. We talked to the elders all through this landscape about their experiences. And they, over their decades of watching, also tell us of the profound changes. Now, in the south, we hear about polar bears floating on ice, not able to hunt. I took this photo a couple years ago of Luki Erut, a 70-year-old master hunter and carver. He, too, is hunting from the sea ice. He's hunting walrus, a staple food for families in the Aglulic region. And this picture reminds us that climate change isn't just affecting the bears, it's affecting human beings. And I think the sooner and easier we digest that information, we bring it in that this is a story of human impact, the greater we are able to realize this is an issue that we have to begin to act upon. Walking through a Glulik, I see one of my young friends being ingenious. He takes the tricycle, he speeds it along with his foot like a skateboard, he crashes into the wood and he goes flying through the air like Superman. He's brilliant because there's not a lot to do in a glue lick. He's making his own fun. He's creative. He's being smart with what he has. That's a hallmark of Inuit society. They're resilient. They take what they've learned and they apply it. And in an Arctic context with global climate change, the Inuit are taking the teachings, the experiences of the changes that they are seeing and they are applying it to becoming better hunters, different hunters, figuring out how to change along with that environment. We can't say the same for ourselves in the South. And ironically, these places in the Arctic that are so vulnerable do very little to contribute to climate change. They're not fossil fuel intense regions, and yet they're most affected. And here in the South, we hear about climate change, but we do very little about it even though the problem is born here. And there's a bunch of psychological literature coming out talking about this phenomenon. Knowledge of a problem, lack of action. And one of the dominant trends in the literature is that if this issue is geographically distant, if it's happening in the Arctic, if it's temporally distant, it's happening at a time scale in the future, if it's outside of our realm of experience, we're less likely to act. And that cognitive dissonance around grappling with the enormity of the challenge is an enormous problem. Thank you, uh, thank you Ian. So while Ian was in the north for all those years, for all those summers, making movies, making friends, I was in my office reading these documents. These are the five reports of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, massive documents summarizing enormous body of research. And what they clearly say, what they clearly say is that climate change is real, it's occurring, it's inevitable in one way or another. It's serious, it's worrisome, it should cause you some discomfort. I've been explaining this to my students over the last 30 years, 
I've been explaining it to anybody who would listen. And yet, we've done so little in the South about it, as Ian said. These documents make clear that climate change that we're experiencing now is not natural. It's not caused by sunspots. It's not caused by volcanoes. It's not caused by gamma rays. It's not caused by conspiracy. It's real. It's real. The evidence of climate change is everywhere. You can't help but see in the media, in the social media, in the newspapers, everywhere, the evidence of climate change. Droughts, heat waves, forest fires, receding glaciers, floods. Antarctica, parts of Antarctica are melting. Greenland, massive amounts of Greenland are melting. The sea ice is in decline in the Arctic. It's everywhere, and yet we've done so little about it. The sobering thing, I think, about this is that all of these changes that we know so much about now, all these observations about what's going on in our beautiful world, is related to one degree of global warming. The world has warmed up just a little bit less than one degree over the last hundred years as a result of, of course, the carbon emissions that you and I add to the atmosphere. One degree. We continue to add carbon dioxide in massive quantities to the atmosphere, so where are we going? If we follow the current trend of carbon emissions, this is where we're going to be near the end of the century. This shows the amount of warming from now to the end of the century if we continue on our current track. That's showing four degrees of warming throughout this century. Four more degrees of global warming. What's that going to be like? Notice that in the part of the world that Ian is so familiar with, in the Arctic, the warming is not four degrees, it's seven, eight, nine, ten degrees warming in the average annual temperature. It's a new climate, a new climate. In our part of the world, in the prairies, in southern Canada, we're still looking at five degrees or so. Five degrees throughout this century. Now I show this, or equivalent of this, to people whenever I get the opportunity, but I understand that people don't get it. As a climatologist, whoa, you know, this is really something, but the average person, and even the educated person, doesn't really get what that means to them, to their home, to our home. And so we have a project at the University of Winnipeg, my super, oh, my super uh, research, research assistant, Ryan Smith, and I and others are working on translating that complex global climate model data into something that's meaningful to you, to us. This map shows how much warmer the winters are going to be in the future. Churchill, at the end of this century, near the end, not even at the end of the century, near the end of the century, if we can't continue in our current ways, will have less than five minus 30 degree days in the year. Currently, they get 55 on average, losing 50 of those cold days new climate. In the south here, in Winnipeg, we get, a, in an average winter, 13 days of minus 30. We will go down to zero in an average winter. Brand new climate. Now, I read minds, and I know that some of you are saying, yay! <laughs> <laughs> cold weather is stressful. Cold weather is harsh. Cold weather is costly. We have to heat our buildings. But there's so much change coming as a result of that, not much of it good. And I also want to remind you that you can't just have global warming in the winter. Summer too. This is where we're going in summer. I want this to cause some discomfort in you. This is how many more plus 30 degree days we will have in the future. Currently in an average year, and this current summer had 12 plus 30 degree Celsius days, in an average year, in the future, we'll have 50. 50 plus 30 days in an average summer in the southern prairies here. Very, very different climate. Let's try to translate that even a little bit more. What, whose climate will we have in the future? In the 2020s, I've just lost my clicker there. Can you uh, click our slides there? Oh, go back two, please. One more, one ahead. There, in the 2020s, North Dakota. A little bit warmer, 
not much different. 2050s, 2050s Ian, Nebraska, and 2080s, North Texas, even New Mexico. That's what 50 plus days of plus 30 is. Complete transformation of our climate, and not in a good way for the most part. We have to get our heads around that. We have to get our heads around that, and yet we have this enormous amount of cogn cognitive dissonance or distances, Ian said. We just don't get it. At the University of Winnipeg, you might have heard recently that we've created a, something called the Center for Climate Risk Reduction on the Prairies. We've renamed it to the Prairie Climate Center in association, in association with IISD and others. We're building a team of people to communicate this important message out to people, to get them to understand it, hopefully prevent it, but deal with it. Ian is a very important member of that team as a filmmaker, and I'll pass it back to Dr. Morrow. So, again, I've had this privilege of traveling Canada, speaking with people about these issues. We've made Inuit Knowledge and Climate Change. We made a film called Climate Change in Atlantic Canada. We interviewed over 100 people in that landscape about the changes that they were seeing and the innovative things that they were doing to address it. Atlantic Canada, with sea level rise, is getting hammered by coastal erosion, all kinds of issues. I'm working on a film right now in BC, climate change in British Columbia. You've just heard in the news about the extreme weather that they've had there. You know, I interviewed Peter Lanton, the president of the Haida Nation, and he said, we live in a rainforest and we don't get rain anymore. The forest fires there, it's unbelievable what is taking place at present. I've had the privilege of traveling with David Suzuki, showing these films in communities where the films are made getting people engaged in the conversation about climate change in their own backyard. And when that dialogue starts to happen, when we get people thinking and seeing and experiencing the changes that will come and are happening in their region, you can see that literature and that theory around cognitive distance start to change. People start to see it. It starts to happen. It becomes real. We've had exhibits, the Royal Ontario Museum in the center bottom there, maps, photos, video, anything we can use through media to engage people is really of interest to us. The mapping that Danny's doing, the filmmaking, we're starting to see that kind of nexus of tools coming together to inspire people that another way is possible. In Atlantic Canada, these are two gentlemen from the Colchester County Wind Farm. Truro, Nova Scotia, small town, couple thousand people. They weren't waiting for government to act. They weren't waiting for industry to come and save them. They said, we're going to make the change in our own community now. What did they do? They put a wind turbine on their hill. They wired that wind turbine to their town. Their town is now off the grid. They put up a bunch of car charging stations. People are driving around in this community, charging up, going to businesses, all powered by wind. They have their energy security and their transport security all at home. It's a remarkable story, but it's not isolated. There's people making changes all over, and it's an exciting time in many ways. We live on this planet. The changes are coming. And those changes, while frightening, you might be sitting here going, holy man, this is my life, this is my place. But the challenges are also an enormous opportunity. When we talk about this idea of the changes coming within a scale that we can comprehend and understand within our daily lives, it will spur action. We will not sit idle while our kids' future melts away. The opportunity is enormous. The transformation that is possible when we realize the enormity of what's at stake will galvanize us to vote for elected officials that are going to make change. That will allow us to realize that we cannot walk through life with the status quo as our modus operandi. We have to think of our children. I've got kids. What kind of world do you want them to grow up in? What kind of opportunities do we want them to have? This is our chance to change society, but also change the way we walk on this earth. We've got our brothers and sisters in the Arctic. 
We've got friends all around who know how to walk lightly. There's sharing of knowledge. There's an opportunity to transform more than just our cities. It's the way we live on this planet. And that's an opportunity that we all have. That's an opportunity to shake the distance of the problem and make it part of our lives, internalize it in our hearts and minds, and step forward in a way that really activates the change we need to see. Thank you.